Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming out and uh, bearing with us as we sorted out the first tour bug of the season. So as mentioned, my name is Artem Babian, and today I'm going to be telling you about how we are entering the platinum age of virus discovery and why the next five years in computational virology is going to define the next five decades of virology research. So, so as I mentioned, this project began like many coronavirus projects at the beginning of the pandemic. So I want you to put your frame of reference back into March of 2020. It was immediately obvious even back then that this COVID-19 pandemic was going to be a society shifting event. And me, like everyone else in the scientific community, you know, we're asking ourselves, what can we do to help? I felt like all my PhD training up until that point was kind of preparing me for that moment where, um, you know, this, this, there's going to be a major change and like millions of people potentially were going to die. So can we contribute? And if you think back, genomic surveillance was really taking off back then. There were billions of dollars watching as this virus was evolving in real time in front of us. So we had this kind of resolution of seeing SARS-CoV-2 evolution at an unprecedented scale. I had a bit of a different question, not so much where is this virus going in the future, but where did this virus come from? What are the proximal and evolutionary origins of SARS-CoV-2? Can I figure that out using kind of nothing but my laptop? And so again, <laughs> A little bit of like commentary. I was a uh, I was a postdoc wrapping up kind of uh, my PhD work at UBC at the time on soft money. So you know the last paycheck that I was going to get was April 2020, and I decided like okay, I'm just gonna you know just give three months to this project. Had to convince my pregnant wife like oh trust me it's worth three months of time and. Um, to to in, invest in this, right? I was I was making this argument. If we pull this off, it's investing in us, babe. Don't worry. Um, but it paid off, so you know she she can't be too angry about it. Yeah. So it wasn't just an academic question to try to figure out where's this virus coming from. SARS-CoV-2 up until today has entered into over 24 species of mammals. There are stable zoonotic reservoirs of the virus, which now are going to be there kind of forever. I, you know, the idea that we would be able to kind of uh, get this to like zero COVID has kind of a little bit gone out the window. And so understanding not just where the virus was coming from, but understanding where and in which reservoirs it exists today is becoming critically important. Because as we have seen, a virus in a bat in China has now affected everyone on the planet and it has a stable infection in white-tailed deer all across North America. So yeah, so we have the deer, we have the minks, 24 species of mammal, beautiful. Okay, we'll take it from here. So this idea is that not only understanding uh, viruses or pathogens evolution in reservoirs is not only important to our health, it's actually directly important to the health of all sorts of animals that you can barely make out on the slide, but that all those animals, their health links back to our health. And so this is an idea of one health. We are interconnected with the animals that we coexist with on earth. We hypothesized that there were missing coronaviruses in already publicly available sequencing data. So what do I mean by publicly available sequencing data? There's this repository called the Sequence Read Archive. So by pure chance in February of 2020, the entire sequence read archive was mirrored onto AWS cloud and Google GCP cloud, right? And so that represents the global collection of sequencing data from all studies where, you know, they generated raw sequencing data, that raw data gets deposited and essentially was forgotten. And I knew just based on data access that if that data is available in the cloud, all of it should be accessible to us in a really short order. So could we reanalyze every scrap of RNA sequencing data on the planet that's publicly available and find those missing coronaviruses? To put that into perspective, currently there are over 60 petabases of sequencing data in the SRA. So that one base can, uh, corresponds to two bytes. So that represents over 120 petabytes of raw sequence data. Right? That's over 10 million biological samples. If you were to quantify how much it would cost to generate that volume of sequencing data, just to run the sequencing machines, that represents 3.7 to $14.9 billion. 
you add in sample acquisition personnel costs, you're talking about $50 billion worth of data that is sitting there underutilized, and we're going to change that. And so if you take one thing from this talk, it's really to gain a deep and meaningful appreciation of public sequencing data. I like to say that the SRA is the modern library of Alexandria for genetics. There are sequencing samples from cancer cell lines at sick kids to water samples taken in Vancouver, uh, in you know just in the harbor there. There's Amazon soil samples. There's even anal swabs of penguins taken in Antarctica, right? And everything in between. Our planet is literally lighting up in sequencing data as we're moving forward. And keep in mind, a large virome study at the time, you know, they would be looking at something like 10,000 samples. We are going to be doing a virome study on the order of millions of samples. And to put that into further context, the volume of sequencing data on the SRA has been doubling steadily for the last 14 years on about a two year time period. That's faster than Moore's law. So, you know, all this volume of data essentially becomes inconsequential in two years because that's only going to be half the data available. And so, you know, we, we set out this very ambitious goal. And me and another unemployed friend of mine who is a computer engineer, um, we developed the Serratus architecture. So this is a AWS cloud native way to deploy large amounts of computing to solve a biological kind of bioinformatics problem. I I'll, won't get into all the nitty gritties, but the kind of take home are that Serratus was aggressively cost optimized to be as efficient per data set as possible. And really that bottleneck was not in the amount of computing we could access, it was how fast could we download that data? IO was the main bottleneck in our analysis. And once we figured out that IO, we could scale horizontally to over 22,000 CPUs, pretty much at the snap of our fingers. It was like push a big red button and AWS cloud lights up. You're burning down a small rainforest every minute. And we could do this because sequence alignment is what is called an embarrassingly parallel problem in computer science terms. What that means is if I want to align a read, the outcome of that alignment is entirely independent of every other read in that library. And so we could exploit that, pro uh, that property by taking a say sequencing data set, an SRA library, we would fracture it into these small atomic units, and then we would process those atomic units on small CPUs. So that's a bit counterintuitive to how most people would approach this problem, where you would put a big data set on a big CPU and kind of churn it away. We went completely the other way, small distributed computing. Why that's so important is, you know, it's really kind of coming to HPC 101. When you have a variable workload going into your HPC cluster, that means you have a variable demand of computing resources that you need to achieve that workload. Right? Whereas if you have a uniform, very well-defined problem, if every little block of data is one gigabyte exactly, then I know what the memory and CPU and time requirements are of my system. The other slightly less intuitive advantage was that this distributes the risk if you get an error. So not only does it decrease the amount of errors, when you do get errors, because we were using interruptible instances, which are one-tenth of the cost of like a normal instance, then if you're doing this long job and it takes hours to process, and then you get an error halfway through, you would say lose 60% of the time you were paying for that CPU process to run. But if you distribute this into many small units of work, when you get that same one error, you multiply based on how much you're fracturing the data, how much time or resources you're losing. Okay, so that's you know kind of well, good and big, but what does that actually mean at the end of the day? Well, with Serratus, we could process over 1 million NGS sequencing libraries per day, and the cost of analysis to analyze a single library was under half a cent. So all of a sudden, this fundamentally shifted our ability to do data analysis at scale. All of this data in the SRA is literally at our fingertips because we can just spool up and sail through all of that data. I think that this represents probably one of the biggest paradigm shifts in how we need to be thinking about bioinformatics moving forward. All, we are no longer limited by the availability of data. We are being limited by our ability to analyze data. And with something like Serratus and kind of the next generation of tools like this, we can analyze data faster than the global production capacity for sequencing data.
So, you know, me on my laptop could do more analysis than the world was producing sequencing data. That was kind of the big like aha moment. And that's when that three months of, babe, I just need three months turned into, okay, I just need another eight months and I swear, you know, things will work out. And so, you know, all of a sudden we, we, we kind of almost accidentally built this enormous hammer. And then if you have a really, really big hammer, you're looking for bigger nails. And so we decided to expand our question, not just where are all the coronaviruses in sequencing data, but where are all the RNA viruses full stop in the sequencing data? And to do this, we have to refine our search. We have to kind of be informed about biology and the evolution. And we can take advantage that RNA viruses are defined by the presence of one hallmark gene, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. This is, I like to say, the beating heart of an RNA virus genome. And so we went through GenBank and every major study available at the time. So at the end of 2020, there were 15,000 known RNA viruses. Those are clustered down at 90% amino acid identity to create uh, approximate species-like units of RNA viruses. What we would normally talk about is like a distinct RNA virus species. And the analysis was focused on a subsequence that corresponds to the catalytic core, the most well-conserved subsequence of the RDRP. Conceptually, this is equivalent to 16S or ITS barcode sequencing that you're familiar with in bacteria or fungi. We created an equivalent system for RNA viruses, and that allowed us to analyze data quickly. And so, you know, applying Serratus, applying our new classification method, we were able to search every RNA sequencing data available at the time, and then some. So we processed 5.7 million sequencing libraries, or 10.2 petabases of sequencing data. And in that search, we discovered over 130,000 new species of RNA viruses. That entire thing was done in 11 days. So to reframe that, it took the global virology community 130 years to find the first 15,000 RNA viruses, and it took us under two weeks to find the next 130,000. That's the, that's the nut that we cracked with this. And so all of a sudden, this entire world of sequencing data gets dropped into an SQL table, and you can do a quick lookup saying, okay, which library has which RDRP? Okay, this library, it's got the perfect match for SARS-CoV-2. We know that because it matched our reference sequence 100% identity. This library, it's got something that kind of looks like rubella virus, but at 80% identity. So if I want a novel rubella virus, that's exactly where I look, right? I don't have to go across millions of data sets, I literally have everything in an SQL table. And so from that, we then took all of the mapping reads. So about 3.3 million libraries had reads that map to RDRP. We assembled those, just the uh, RDRP mapping reads. So this, we called it microassembly. And from that, we recovered 880,000 sequences that were RDRP containing sequences. And then that was clustered down to the 130,000 new species that we reported. And so coming back to that question, if you wanna go looking for new coronaviruses, SQL lookup, all you have to do is ask the question, okay, tell, show me the coronaviruses, the ones that are under 90% identity that corresponds to a new species, and you get your list of 80 libraries to look for. We go in, we assemble those libraries, and we find some of the craziest coronaviruses uh, that were described to date. So, the beauty of doing a large unbiased project is that you find things that you really were not expecting to find. And what we found were coronaviruses in aquatic vertebrates. So we have axolotl, fugu fish, seahorse. There was a closely characterized virus in Pacific salmon that actually a friend of mine at UBC found two years prior. And then we found these nine new species of coronavirus related to it. So what further insights did that give us? Well. When we went in and actually assembled, so these are now you know, full library assemblies, we kept missing the structural genes, the spike, right? And so we, you know, we thought like, okay, is this some kind of error where we're just not able to get the structural genes? But in one case, specifically the axolotl virus, we had 40 libraries with that axolotl virus in it. And none of them had the spike on the same content. And so we kind of asked the silly question, okay, well, where is the spike? Well, it was actually related to a different spike, but these viruses, so you can see here's the axolotl context, their structural genes are encoded 
on a separate contig. And so that is consistent with a segmented genome. So if you think of segmented RNA virus genomes, usually you think of influenza, where it's got multiple segments, and that allows for a rapid uh, reassortment of contigs in evolution. We have now defined, so seven of these species were coronaviruses with segmented genomes. That violates the textbook definition of what a coronavirus is. And we could just pick that out from the data, and it was kind of a, a very strong signal. Again, not only do we see the same thing in all the libraries, but we see it in multiple different species of coronavirus. And so I think that this kind of lays the groundwork for what the next era of virology is going to look like. You know, as we've seen with SARS-CoV-2, we are entering an era of genomic surveillance. We need to understand pathogen evolution at the global scale and how these things spread. And the World Health Organization just last year put together this beautiful white paper, and it talks about what are going to be the major barriers to genomic surveillance deployment at the global health scale. And one of the main ones that they talk about is how genomic surveillance and the analysis of genomic data is going to be a major inhibitor of its implementation. And so I view the strategic direction kind of of the lab now is to build the tools and build the know-how to allow for, um, you know, cutting edge genomic surveillance tools to, de to be deployed in the developing world in places that are resource scarce, because we can make a tool that can work for a penny or two, and we can provide the computing for free and give everyone access to cutting edge genomics analysis. And this is becoming critically important in this context of an exploding amount of sequencing data. Because what I like to say is like, we have this pyramid and it's a very unequal pyramid. We have more and more data and we're seeing this in machine learning fields as well. And all of this wealth of data needs to be parsed into knowledge, things like Wikipedia articles, things that condense down data and make that into knowledge that is human communicable. Because that base of knowledge, that base of the literature is gonna give us this little tiny yeah. bit of right. wisdom so that when the next pandemic rolls around, we can act more wisely, right? And so what I view is not only are we moving from data to knowledge, like can we automate that step? Can we create knowledge interfaces that are completely procedurally generated to allow physicians and public health officials to have the maximum amount of wisdom from this giant wealth of data? And so not only did we do this analysis, we created a front end interface, serratus.io, that publicly hosts and serves all of this data. Uh, if you want a sticker, about the Stratus project, come see me later. I got them. Um, and importantly, we were using all publicly available sequencing data and all the data and analysis products that we created, we also released into the public domain immediately following the lead of the Human Genome Project. And just an example of what that translates to, um, there is there was a paper that came out six months after Serratus came out. They used our database and they queried where do activated this in this case DNA viruses where do viruses reactivate in unusual places? And they were able to identify that human herpes six virus reactivates to very high levels in T cells that are cultured. So why is that important? Well, there's this therapy called CAR T cell therapy in which you take T cells from a patient. You culture them, you engineer them, and you reintroduce them into a cancer patient. Now, if they observe that cultured T cells have a reactivation of this virus, you are now putting a reactivated virus into the bloodstream of a chemo of a cancer patient. And it is a well-known side effect in rare cases, albeit, that CAR T cell therapy is associated with neurotoxicity and encephalitis. And this group has now made this link where it's actually the CAR T cell therapy itself that is the likely origin of the reactivated HHV6 virus. And so, you know, as I alluded to, it's really important to create data interfaces for um, what we create, not just to dump a bunch of data into SQL or a bunch of FASTA files. And so we worked on Palm ID. And the idea here being that you can take any RNA virus known or novel put the RDRP sequence into this little box, it'll spool up a little microserver, and then it will cross-reference all of the metadata from the SRA and give you a report of where this virus was observed. 
the goal that this like Palm ID is addressing is if a kid shows up at Sick Kids Hospital with a fever of unknown origin, it should take 30 seconds and cost one cent to connect the virus in that patient's blood to a camel sampled in Sub-Saharan Africa in 2012. And so, you know, we, we go on and, and that's what we show. We were interested in rubella virus. So there were two recently discovered rubella viruses, Rastrella and Rahugu. And in a two minute web search, we identify three additional new species of rubella virus. We can go in, aggregate geospatial data. So you can see, oh, one of those novel rubella viruses showed up in a bat in China. Uh, here's all the host labels that are associated with it. And then you go into those libraries, you assemble them. Lo and behold, here's three new species of rubella virus. This can be done easy peasy now. And so we can now reconceptualize the sequence read archive, not as just a public repository of data, but as a planetary viral surveillance network. As biologists across the planet are going out and sampling the natural environment, we can sit there and for something like you know, fifty to eighty thousand dollars a year. We are going to turn that billions of dollars of data into a passive surveillance network. So, if pathogens show up, not only do we identify them, we have that record in the future to always refer back to. And keep in mind, what we did is only the tip of the iceberg because the data is growing exponentially faster than Moore's law. And so, you can ask the question: Okay, well, if the data is doubling, does that mean that by now you found another hundred fifty thousand viruses? Because that was two years ago? Well, no, because this is where we kind of intersect with bioinformatics. We did kind of the very surface level skimming of the data because as if you look at here, uh, virus divergence from known, um, these are all new species. This is a histogram. And you can see that about 50% identity, there's this dip in new species. And the question is like, well, is there just those species don't exist? That's not true. It's actually the limitation of sequence alignment, right? By the time you get to 50% identity, we can only recover about 30% of the reads that correspond to that virus. So that means that no one really knows how deep that well goes. There's a huge reservoir of kind of these dark RNA viruses, the ones that are very difficult to find by conventional methods. And so you could kind of do the naive approach. You take our newly found viruses, you re-perform serratus, and you build it out like an onion, pushing into the dark matter of sequence space. Or you can be lazy, which is what I love to do, and say, okay, what if we work really, really, really hard, try to find a few deep representatives of RNA viruses, and then we rerun serratus. So not only just exploring from our onion, but exploring from many deep reference points and use that to blow up the sequence space of RNA viruses. And that's essentially what we did now. We're, you know, we call this like illuminating the dark viral. So very roughly what this looked like was we took the 50,000 sequence assemblies that we had, we clustered them into about 39 million open reading frames. And then the beauty of having a little bit of success is that more people offer you computing. And so we're like, yes, we'll take the computing that we can get. And so we ran HHPRED and AlphaFold or an accelerated version called ColabFold on those 39 million open reading frames, literally just trying to fold stuff with no expectation of whatever is gonna come out. And then we created a structural classifier to recognize that exact same barcode sequence, but now in structure space. And that allowed us access to these dark RNA viruses that go well beyond 20% identity to known sequences. This is looking behind the veil of what is possible through sequence space. And so using that reference set, we then reanalyzed now seven and a half million sequencing libraries and so currently we're sitting at just over half a million RNA viral species in the database. So this was what was known. That was our first paper. That's what we're working on currently. And you can see in the intermediate term, there was a, a science cell, and this is probably going to be another CNS paper as well. And then we can just blow them out of the water repeatedly because really what the difference is between something like Serratus and these other major studies is that these are still limited in that old framework where I want to generate the data and only analyze my own data, where we take the opposite, say, the data already exists. We don't have to go and spend a billion dollars to generate a bunch of new sequencing data. We already have $15 billion of data. And so kind of maybe one of the main take-homes is that 
yeah, that was the space of known RNA viruses. And Serratus kind of blew it up. You know, we can pat ourselves on the back all day and say, okay, we did a great job. But I think that grossly misinterprets kind of what I see as the future for this type of work. Because if you put that into context of the viral biodiversity that is out there, we have not even scratched the surface. There's a whole space of new virology to be discovered. And that's why I'm saying in the next five years, we're going to push into this dark matter for the very first time through advanced computational methods. And that's where the most interesting biology is going to happen. So I'll give you, uh, and so I believe that the combined exponential growth in data production and the increased capacity for data analysis will lead to a hyper exponential expansion of RNA viruses putting us on track for 100 million RNA viruses characterized by the end of the decade. That's the objective of my lab, is to hit that 100 million mark before anyone else. And so I think that this is opening up what I refer to as the platinum age of virus discovery. We are going to be defining a new era, and it has never been a more exciting time to be in computational biology than it is today. And so, you know, Anyone in my lab will, will pretty much tell you, like, we're trying to ask the most fundamental, the basic questions that we can get. So the first thing that I was after was like, I, you know, Alzheimer's, it looks like a pretty neuroinflammatory disease. I bet you there's an RNA virus that's causing Alzheimer's. And so how would we ask such a fundamental question from the Sequence Street Archive? Well, we use this new Serratus V2 data. And then we simply parse the metadata in the SRA for any metadata terms that correspond to brain or central nervous system. And that gave us about 480,000 data sets from which we focused on the 82,000 human data sets. And then we just got like a list and literally we're just going through it, be like, give us a weird virus that's in this list and let's see what we actually land on. And so this was a high school student that made the discovery he ended up finding that we hit this no 2017 data. And so just to give you context of what that experiment was that we found just a random dark RNA virus in, they had three human cell lines and they infected them with nine different strains of a unicellular parasite called Toxoplasma gondii, right? And so within this experiment, the no 2017, oh, data set, this dark virus, which we then named Achaevirus odysseus, I'll get to why in a second, we found it in four of the RNA-seq libraries, and it, all of those libraries were found in one strain of Ruby, and it was in none of the controls. And so all of a sudden, we made this association, okay, here's a really weird virus, but it does show up in a neuronal data set, but it showed up inside of a parasite, is what we thought initially. And so what is Toxoplasma gondii? Well, it's a global pathogen, it's a single cellular eukaryotic parasite. It infects and goes inside the cell. It does this through an active process. So it can gain access to any cell type in the human body, and it actually can infect any warm-blooded animal. It is a third of the global population of humans is seropositive for T. gondii. So it means that the, you know, the amount of people that are exposed to this pathogen is on the order of multiple billions. And very importantly is that every, this, uh, Toxoplasma gondii is able to form these cysts, and those cysts can reside in the brain and have been associated with neurodegeneration and neuroinflammation. But the vast majority of Toxoplasma gondii is asymptomatic. We, you know, we don't think about it or we get a small fever, but sporadically, T. gondii can create really uh, bad infections, so it can get very, very severe. And so when we analyze this data, it showed up in exactly one of these severe Toxoplasma gondii strains. This Rube strain was isolated from a French soldier in the Amazon basin in 1991. He came down with like uh, fluid in the lungs, rails, multiple uh, kidney failure, and he had really bad fever, se uh, severe organ damage. And all of a sudden we're seeing that particular strain of T. gondii has high levels of this virus, Achaevirus odysseus virus. Um, so Odysseus, just as a fun fact, he is the Greek mytho mythological um, soldier who built the Trojan horse to get into the city of Troy. And so in the same way, we thought, well, T. gondii is kind of like our Trojan horse, and it can get into the brain in exactly this way. So we have a virus hiding in the Trojan horse 
that is T gondii. And so then we decided, okay, that was that one study. Where else do we observe Odysseus virus? Uh, we then hit a second study. This one was in 2013. They also compared 28 strains of T. gondii. We saw high levels of expression of the virus, not in 28 strains, not in the mock, but it was limited to this group strain. And then there was another strain, which was also positive called Cougar, which was isolated in Canada. And so Cougar and Ruby are as different T. gondii as possible. So here's Cougar, here's Ruby. This is a phylogeny of T. gondii. These are radically different strains of T. gondii. Both of them cause severe disease when they're in humans, and that severe disease is unrelated. But they are, they do share a common factor that they're infected by a virus. And then fun fact is T. gondii cougar strain. Uh, so yeah, it's also hypervirulent. It caused the 1994 toxoplasma outbreak in Victoria, BC, where a mountain lion pooped into the Victoria watershed and infected between seven and 12,000 people. And a lot of those people were um, identified, like why we know about this toxo outbreak is they got eye damage, right? So the toxo would get in their eyes and cause eye damage through inflammation. Now, the fun fact as like, as we go down this rabbit hole, trying to characterize this virus in its context, we go to this Milo 23 study, and what they noted was that both Cougar and Ruby were outliers in their capacity to trigger interferon beta in mouse cells. And then, you know, they do a bunch of genetic studies that essentially narrow that down to being nucleic acid mediated. So it's mediated by the RIG pathway and by IRF, IRF3. And so they, you know, they created this model where for some reason, these two completely unrelated strains of T. gondii, they both trigger uh, hyperinflammation and it's somehow nucleic acid based. And for us, we looked at that and we're like, well, it's the virus, right? That's what these two things share in common. And so we go back to our neuronal data sets from 2017. We do differential gene expression analysis now, and we compare uh, in human neurons the Ruby strain and the other strains of T. gondii. And you can't see it here, sorry, but um, the Rube strain, so the one carrying the virus, shows a high level interferon response. There's interferon beta, and that virus, that gene signature, looks like an antiviral response. And so we have evidence that there is a physiological response, pro-inflammatory, to the virus once it's inside the neurons. And so, you know, here's their model where they list these exotic strains of cougar and ruby. Somehow they kind of go dot, dot, dot. The parasites, DNA or RNA, trigger the inflammation, where what we're saying now is, yeah, you get these, but that's when the virus is infected in those. And then that is what's leading to um, IRF-37 or IRF-3-mediated pro-inflammatory. And so, you know, kind of coming back to our question, is this a neuroinflammatory virus? Absolutely, the mechanism is there. Would I have ever predicted that this is physiologically relevant to humans? Not in a million years, right? But if we could go in and analyze the data without bias and just see what's the data telling us, we can land in this area of completely unexpected biological discovery. And so now we, you know, that was done about two months ago. We pulled everyone together in the lab. We put up a preprint, send it off to UC Davis, to the veterinarians that have the strain. They were over the moon. They were like, you know, everything makes sense. And so, you know, now we're going to go through biological validation. And then I expect, you know, in three, four years, we'll get an answer on uh, what we did in two months, if it was right or not. But the beauty is we can make such a refined hypothesis very, very quickly. And I think that's, that's the power of computational biology moving forward. It's not going to be you know, establishing causation, that's the limit of what we can do. But what we can do is we can get to that hypothesis that directly addresses what is like the most plausible hypothesis. So yeah, expect the unexpected. And so, you know, the, the name of the lab is the Laboratory for RNA-Based Life Forms. I also have stickers for that lab if you want. Um, so, you know, it is a new lab. We're just starting up. It's, you know, not even a year old. It'll be a year old on October 1st. So if you're interested in, you know, kind of big data analysis, let me know. My email is there. There I am on Twitter. Here's uh, not everyone, but a bunch of us from the lab from earlier in the summer. And, you know, I just like to thank everyone. This is all very collaborative work. Last bit of little, um, say, annotation of research. Um, when we published the Serratus work, 
we listed everyone as co-first authors. So it took a little bit of wrangling with the editor, but the idea was that like, this was a purely volunteer based hackathon project, right? And like, I couldn't pay anyone because I was unemployed myself. But what I did was I said to everyone, volunteer your time, it's a good idea. And if you do so, we come, we come into this project as equals and we'll publish as equals. And that was enough of a message to kind of bring everyone together. And the amount of work that each of those authors did is completely you know, mind blowing. We, we came together in this like time of crisis and we worked you know, 60, 80 hour weeks with no promise of anything in the future, just kind of a good idea and a vision for what we thought was possible. And so with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for your time.